It is my pleasure to welcome our illustrious speaker, and in particular, my parish pastor, Father Jack McClure from Most Holy Redeemer in the Castro, um, who will be moderating and helping move the conversation along. So I'm going to kick it off for y'all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Matthew, for coming and joining us. We're looking forward to hearing uh, your perspectives and how you came to them and sharing with the uh, group gathered here today uh, ways that we all can think with you and how our thinking might need to change as well or we'd be invited to. So as a Roman Catholic priest, I'm excited to uh, listen to how you present because it's an important uh, topic in my church right now. And my understanding is key, so I join with this group here and looking forward to your comments. So thank you for being here. Welcome. Well, thank Tell you so much. Tell us about you a little bit so that we will know how you came to the positions that you're holding and enlighten us. All right. Well, first I want to say thank you to Raymond for inviting me and the whole uh, LGBT Pride Week team for coordinating. Really appreciate that. It is wonderful to be here. Uh, so you want some of my backstory in terms of how I, how I got to this point? I thought in your book, I got to look at your book and, and to read some parts of it. I thought it was very interesting, the beginning part of when you decided you needed to come out to go home and to share with your family and your parents. So. Right, so that was the fall of 2009 that I first acknowledged to myself that I was gay. The reason why that was difficult was because I am from Kansas, from Wichita, Kansas, uh, and grew up in a conservative, evangelical, Presbyterian church there where there was just no open conversation around being gay or anything other than straight. Uh, we actually had a good friend who had grown up just a couple years older than me in our church, was really well regarded until he came out his sophomore year of college. And then it was like he had been erased from mm -hmm. the memory of the community and nobody wanted to talk about him anymore. It was, uh, it was very frustrating to witness that, but also that's those are all the sorts of things that made it difficult for me to accept the fact that I was gay because my parents would not be okay with that. So many of our closest family friends from church would not mm -hmm. be okay with that. But if you are gay, you kind of have to deal with it eventually. Well, you don't have to, but it's going to eat away at you pretty significantly if you don't. So it helped me a lot going away to Harvard for college. Uh, I think we have some, do we have some Harvard 2012 people in the house? I know we have at least one Harvard 2012 person in the house who's not raising his hand. That's okay. Um, and yeah, so but Harvard is a very, very different place from Kansas. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people knew that, um, but they're, they're slightly different. And one of the biggest differences, I mean, one of the biggest differences is that like it was really cold and depressing. Um, but apart from that, I think that's just an East Coast thing. The, there was much more openness to LGBT students on campus, mm -hmm. which was awesome. And that helped me to really experience what life could look like as a gay person and be able to actually see that it's possible to have a dignified future mm -hmm. as a gay person, um, <clears throat> which is something that, you, you know, we all read the same headlines in the newspapers about gay rights and things like that. But the way that you experience those headlines is shaped very much by your immediate family and community context. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even though I knew that gay marriage was being legalized in different places, I still had no direct examples in my life of people who were gay where that did not result in complete ostracization or ostracism or rejection or uh, stigma attached to them. So growing up in the community I did, if you wanted to be a successful, <coughs> respectable person, being gay was incompatible with that. Now, obviously, that's just not true in so much of the rest of the country, but not only is that steeped in your community, it's also steeped in your understanding of God and of faith and Christianity if, you're, if you grew up in a Christian environment. So it's, there, the barriers to sort of reconsidering that mm -hmm. are, are really steep, but being at a place like Harvard was extremely helpful for me in being able to process some of these questions First, at an impersonal level, I joined the only groups at Harvard that would not be okay with it if I came out, <laughs> um, which are like the conservative Christian ministries, because that's where I found the most continuity with 
my faith community from back home. And those were some of the best communities that I found at school, actually. Um, but, and so the first year that I was at school, I really started asking a lot more questions like to other people in the group about, I'm not really sure I agree with what this group mm-hmm. is saying and what the church I grew up in is saying about gay marriage. And so we had some informal gatherings about it. I read some, we had some discussions, helped me to really change my mind um, on the issue. At that point, it, it wasn't a total 180. I already felt very strongly like mm-hmm. there was a, like I couldn't accept what I had been raised with for just basic Christian principles of justice and all of those things. But I still didn't know how to articulate that from the Bible-based standpoint that I grew up with. And so being able to learn a little bit more about that helped me to decide that I, that I, was, that I was convinced that LGBT issues were justice mm-hmm. issues and that some, there was something I wanted to mm-hmm. advocate for. And it was only after that point that then I could ask myself whether mm-hmm. or not I was gay, which I wasn't very thrilled about, even though I didn't think there was anything wrong with being gay anymore, just because I didn't want to deal with the potential loss of so many relationships. So I ended up taking a semester off school, going home, coming out to my parents, and then just working through the conversation around the Bible and same-sex relationships with them. They were not thrilled that I was gay, uh, and they were also totally shocked. Like, that just wasn't within their, very few of my friends were all that shocked, but it wasn't within their, Mm -hmm. sort of the realm of possibility for them because Mm -hmm. they figured if you raise your child well, then they're not gonna be gay which we know is not how it works, right. but that's how a lot of Christian parents sort of approach it or avoid thinking about it. But they ended up changing their minds. And my, for my dad in particular, studying the Bible and same-sex relationships was pivotal mm-hmm. for him changing his mind. And so I a lot like of what I've you, been... I like how you did that in the book. Uh, along that line, what let you then move from... I think I, I gathered that his probing and his looking at the, the scriptures with you See, that's a tradition that your uh, particular faith community would have, not always the, the tradition that some here are, are a part of. So biblically based, uh, then you went in to strive and to delve more deeply. How did you move from that place with your father and you, coming to that understanding? What let you get underneath the things that have let you come to the conclusions that I think you state very interestingly in your book? How did you get there? Well, so it's a couple things. One, growing up in a Protestant evangelical home, sola scriptura is kind of the, mm-hmm. the mantra, right? And say and, what and that means. That only scripture, scripture alone, right. uh, is how we learn about God and how we discern what is true. In the sense that specifically right. as in opposition to the Catholic Church right. and the idea that you, get, you, know, you figure out what's true about scripture through the magisterium, which we got through the magisterium instead, no, you know, just going back to the principles of the Reformation, we're gonna figure it out on our own. Now, obviously that spawned, you know, several tens of thousands of denominations, but it and, also- And relative to that, that's important to us here, is in a, from a Roman Catholic or some of your more um, um, ritualistic celebrations of church would see the sacrament as, as the, in combination with the magisterium is the way we would say that. And the Protestant tradition would say, in Scripture alone, sola scriptus, as you called it, right. in, in Scripture alone. And so, actually, it seems to me that we're kind of moving toward a better understanding on the Roman Catholic side of Scripture, because we had not studied it as people, as the people of God, our priests had and theologians. But you got into some of that study, which I think has become very, very important to you, to understand that which is underneath some of the scriptural texts. Is that? Yes, and I'm just saying part of the reason why that study is possible or possible to be more effective within my context is because, theoretically at least, with Protestants, all you have to do is convince someone of a different interpretation of the text. Exactly. And that is all, in theory, that is required in order to change beliefs and then change doctrines. Now, obviously, there are natural institutional hurdles as well, but they're not formal institutional hurdles that are this anywhere like what you have in the Catholic Church. So what I ended up doing was finding every resource that I could get my hands mm-hmm. on about the Bible and homosexuality. And there were two main types of resources that I found. One were uh, very academic texts mm-hmm. that often had a lot of wonderful research in them, but were just quite inaccessible for somebody mm-hmm. who, you know, for your average person at church, you might want to ask to reconsider 
who has a job and four kids, you can't say, go read this 500-page tome that is in six languages, mm -hmm. and then can you let me know what you think about it? That's just not, a, that's, not a, right. that's not sufficient. But there's still a lot of important things there. But I also found a lot of more popular level literature that was easy to read but did not speak to people like my parents in a way that was going to be helpful. Because it would start off and it would, it would express presuppositions about the Bible from the very beginning that would be offensive mm -hmm. to, say, my dad. If you start off and you say, well, the Bible says a lot of wacky things and we just need to take it a little bit less seriously. Or if that's the impression somebody gets mm -hmm. from the first two pages of your book, my dad won't read beyond the first two pages of your book. Because the way that this debate has been cast for a lot of conservative Christians, and part of the reason why LGBT issues remain so fraught in a lot of the country, especially middle America and the South, is because many Christians have come to believe that if they change what they think about same-sex relationships, they're actually going to be required to change the entire like infrastructure for their faith. And it's not just a question of interpreting a select amount of texts in the Bible, but it's a question of whether or not the Bible should carry the same weight and significance in their lives at all. Mm -hmm. And so if, you, if I were to give a resource to somebody at my church that basically indicates change your mind on same-sex relationships by taking the Bible less seriously, that's just not going to fly because you're going to the very heart of what is most important to someone's mm -hmm. worldview and asking them to set it aside. Some people may be willing to do that, not most people. And if that is all that LGBT kids growing up in conservative Christian homes have at their disposal when they're coming out, that's not nearly sufficient for them. And so part of what I wanted to do was to take a lot of, to synthesize a lot of the best insights of academics and biblical scholars, but then represent them in both a much more accessible form, but also specifically within the theological framework that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that requires revisions. There might be somebody, you know, you can have some of the, I mean, there are scholars I cite in my book who are, uh, you know, very progressive Christians, who are atheists, agnostics. You know, you don't have to, it doesn't really matter what your faith is in terms of how you do historiography, right? So one of the best historians of ancient what we would call sexuality, even though it's kind of an anachronism, is David Halperin, who's not of any religion at all, but I would still happily rely on a lot of his work to understand a lot of the ancient constructs and context around sexuality. However, there's, you, you can only rely on that kind of work so far, and then you have, to, but you have to put it within your own context and make sure that you're grounding it within principles around scripture that are consistent with those of your community. So that was really what I set out to do with my dad, initially just like over dinner table conversations when I was home. Then it turned into engaging our church much more widely. Then it led me to, two years later, give a, an hour long talk at a church in Wichita, Kansas, where I'm from, all about the Bible and homosexuality, specifically within that framework for mm -hmm. more conservative Christians. And then that talk, led to the book, God and the Gay Christian, which came out last year. And so all of it is really designed, it's about giving the specific language and the specific mm -hmm. approach that can be persuasive to like evangelicals and to conservative Christians. Mm -hmm. Some people are not open to being persuaded right now. However, right. they're really not my target audience because there are people, they're still a minority, but there is a significant minority of people in the evangelical Christian world who are open to being persuaded. Okay. And you simply have to give them a strong enough biblical argument in order to succeed. I think one of the things that I noted in your book that I really appreciated is how you bring it to the experience, how you let the lived experience of, of what happening is what is happening within the world of uh, LGBT and transgender and gay, uh, the whole population. I think you give good examples of how they have experienced that separation. And I think you address that too. Yes, there are a couple things about that. I think that experience matters a lot, but especially when you're talking to conservative Christians, it's important that you don't present experience as somehow overriding scripture. Because that's the way that we all know that there are a lot of heart, really heart-rending stories that, people, that LGBT people have about mm -hmm. how they've been treated by families, churches, um, society at large. However, a lot of conservative Christians 
have a kind of built-in resistance to listening to those stories when the stories are presented in opposition to scripture, even if not explicitly. Part of the reason why many uh, conservative Christians, you might send them, if you, uh, like, if you have friends um, who are evangelical or just on the more, right, who are not, what I would call, are not LGBT affirming, and then you might send them a really heartwarming, it gets better video, and then they watch it, and it really doesn't seem to have reached them, but it doesn't seem to engage them. One reason why it doesn't reach them many times is because there is this kind of wall built up that they filter things like that through, and that wall is this biblical interpretation that says, this experience, in order for me to accept its legitimacy in a meaningful enough way to make mm -hmm. me rethink what I think, is in conflict with this core aspect of my worldview, which is the Bible. And so what I'm trying to do when I talk about experience is specifically talk about why it doesn't have to be in conflict. And so at the very beginning of my book, I talk about how in the Sermon on the Mount, in the book of Matthew, Jesus talks about, he offers his followers a kind of test for how to discern false prophets. And he says, by their fruits, you will recognize them. Mm -hmm. A good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And the, and the Bible talks about what the fruit of the Spirit looks like in the book of Galatians. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, those kinds mm -hmm. of things. Those are the types of traits that we see in many same-sex relationships today. Conversely, when LGBT people are rejected by their churches, by their families, that leads that doesn't lead to the fruit of the spirit as the Bible describes it. It leads to profound devastation, isolation, harm, pain, suffering. And so that kind of, a better way I've found to approach the experience argument is to put it within the context of Jesus's own teachings and say, according to Jesus's own teachings, if we're seeing bad fruit, then that's coming from a bad tree. And so, if the teaching that all same-sex relationships are sin is producing bad fruit, the teaching itself may be a bad tree. And so that doesn't mean that alone solves the issue, but it's a, it helps to open the door for people to maybe be more willing to reconsider, but then you still have to convince them of, the main biblical, uh, of how to read the main biblical texts that refer to same-sex relations. And isn't That's that, helpful. And isn't that what your father showed you in his experience? You came home, in the telling of the story, you came home, it upset both of them, the way you explained it in your book, but in the final analysis, they loved you, and in their experience, that changed, that had to change their perspective on what does it mean to have a gay son? What does it mean to have that member be in my family, and he's mine? Right, well, they didn't have any perspective on having a gay son before, because that right. wasn't within what they thought was possible. But for my dad, I would say that me coming out to him changed his heart, mm -hmm. but his mind did not change until we did an in-depth study of scripture. And he would not have been open to that, that right. investigation without that experience. Right. My... And so experience is very important, but also, they but, rarely is it, but rarely is it sufficient exactly. for people coming from more conservative faith backgrounds. And I think that what we have in our population that's here with us today is a deeper understanding, a better understanding of how people are people, different as we are. Variance is a, a more, um, we talked at lunch, people from all over. Well, when you start bringing different perspectives and views, it changes the experience. And as you have friends who are gay and as you have family members that are gay and lesbian and, and all of that, I think then you would take a different approach. Your research is really timely in terms of the conversation that's happening because you went under it from not just an academic point of view, but it seems to me that you tried also to look at the culture behind it and in addition to just the literal academic part, which the culture is extremely important. Would you share a little bit about how that, what, how that formed your thinking? Well, part of, and this may not be the exact question that you're asking, so tell me if I'm going off track here. But part of the cultural analysis for me is about how to take a message and really put it into action. So how do you actually get into, if it is possible, and I do think it is possible. So for my dad, right, it's kind of like 
what I was seeking to fashion was like almost a key to mm -hmm. unlock the door to like changing his mind. And relationships are a critical piece of that, but the scriptural argument is equally critical. And so it's like the, the book is the scriptural argument. But then the question is, from a cultural standpoint, even once you have that, there's still the question of how do you actually put that into practice to affect widespread change? And so that's really what I'm seeking to do through the nonprofit organization that I run. Which and is, the name of it is? It's called the Reformation Project. And I started it a couple years ago. We run conferences around the country for Christians, uh, what we call uh, LGBT affirming Christians in non-affirming contexts. And specifically designed to give them the Bible-based tools that they need to empower them to become vocal advocates mm -hmm. for the LGBT community in their churches. So we just did a big conference in Atlanta a week and a half ago. We had several hundred people come from mostly across the South. And the goal through these conferences is about training and equipping. So because there are what I call silent sympathizers in churches of almost all kinds, no matter how conservative, a minority of people who feel a sense of conflict mm -hmm. about their church's posture. But the main reason why they don't give voice to their sense of internal conflict is because they don't know how to talk about the Bible and same-sex relationships in a way that will even potentially be persuasive mm -hmm. to other people in their church. And so what we, we work to do is to identify those silent sympathizers mm -hmm. and then to equip them, to give them the messages that they need. And it doesn't make it easy. It doesn't make them, that does not produce success with everyone. It probably only produces success with a minority of people, but really that's all you need. Because in a church like the one that I grew up in of 2,000 people, not a single person before I came out had been willing to say publicly that they did not believe that same-sex relationships were sinful. And once I came out, we found out that some of our friends privately did not believe that same-sex relationships were wrong. But they would not give voice to that publicly because the, pr the pressure not to do so was so great, and they didn't know how to really speak to people's core concerns about that. So that's, that's really our goal then through the Reformation Project. We it know seems we like have, it's a, an opportunity then for people to give voice to their own thoughts and their own experiences. So that's a very important part of the unloosing understanding, I think, of other or of difference. You know, I think we're seeing that in religions, uh, certainly from a Roman Catholic point of view. I am very interested in how we're going to interface with our Protestant brothers and sisters to uh, finally become unified. The research that you did, and the part that I found so interesting and, and intriguing with what you were looking at is, you not only looked at the culture of that time, now you're trying to bring it to the culture of this time. I thought that was significant. You gave an example of how some things have been forbidden in Old Testament and they're not in our understanding today. Would that help any clarity, bring clarity, do you think, the, to the people about how texts can be used? I think it's important for them to understand that from you. Okay, yeah, so part of the <clears throat> cultural argument that I make in terms of interpreting texts, specifically ancient texts, requires a broader understanding of ancient con concepts and constructions of <clears throat> what we call sexuality. Or any kind of given communication. For instance, and, and this will be really strange, but today it's hard for us not to imagine people being able to read and write and having access to pencil and paper. With the computerization that we have, it's almost instant. But when we look back, we realize just how much they relied on auditory and listening and telling stories, and how those stories then became part of scripture, and what, what caused that. I thought that what you're, the way you presented your information about that was very telling, because it opened up that something that was extremely important to be taboo at, at, with them at that time, was hygiene related perhaps, or related to other things, and we don't see it that way today. We see difference, we see a different understanding. You presented those kind of understandings for me when you reinterpreted, not reinterpreted, but uh, what's the language that you use? You re the text. Well, I mean, I certainly am arguing for a reinterpretation, but I wouldn't place that agency primarily on me because Part of my goal with the book was not actually to be making any original arguments, as odd as that may sound, because what I'm trying to do is to synthesize and to popularize the best of the arguments and insights that have been pioneered, debated, vetted, and refined by people with far greater expertise in a lot of particular fields than I could possibly have. You looked very widely, though. 
very widely. Yes. And so that's why my goal is I didn't want to, if I was going to be making an argument that actually hadn't been made and challenged and then supported again and, and further refined, I didn't want to make that mm -hmm. argument because that would, argument would be likely to fall apart. So I try with all the arguments that I make and all the historical uh, analyses, interpretations, like I don't want any of them to be original to me. So in that sense, like I am arguing for a reinterpretation, but I'm also wanting to argue, I'm also wanting to point people toward the scholars and the writers and the theologians who I think have maybe you know done the best work on this particular um, nook, right? And this particular cranny, like all, all these particular aspects and then bring them all together into a more cohesive whole. Was it evident to you somewhere along the line of your research and your reading and looking and talking with your dad and looking, looking forward, did it become evident to you sometime that you said, aha, this is very, this is different than what I had thought? Where did that, how did that come to you? I, I would be very interested in if you could pinpoint it, it might be yeah, hard. Yeah, I mean, no, there are a couple of things and a couple specific texts that I'm happy to go into. And then if anybody has questions, Question. we'd be happy to, to take them at that point. So think about it if you have any. Yeah. Um, so one text is this famous text from the Old Testament about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is no longer really at the forefront of the conversation anymore. But it's remarkable how many Christians still associate Sodom and Gomorrah with gayness. So when I asked my dad in high school why we were against gay rights, because I knew that we were, but I just wasn't really sure why, <laughs> um, he just sat me down, opened his Bible to Genesis chapter 19, and read to me this story where God sends two angels in the form of men into the city of Sodom. The men of Sodom attempt or threaten to rape the angels, and God then destroys the city with fire and brimstone. And so because these men were threatening to rape at least what appeared to be other men, my dad said, well, these men wanted to have sex with men. God destroyed them for it. That's why we're against gay rights. That does not make my dad sound like a very sophisticated person. But in fact, he really is. He just wasn't on this topic mm -hmm. because he didn't know any openly gay people. He had never been forced to think very deeply about it. But when I came out to him, that was the first text that he went back to. And he sort of said, hmm, I may not know as much as I thought I knew about this subject. Because this text now, looking at it in the light of a broader understanding of gay people, that is so different from the type of relationship that you, Matthew, want, right? Like we're talking about a threatened gang rape. Mm -hmm. And for anybody who knows any gay people, these distinctions are incredibly obvious. But if you don't know any gay people and you just know, well, I know homosexuality is a sin. I know that's because of stuff in the Bible. I know that people bring up this text, so there must be a connection then you go into the text searching for the connection. And even though it's quite tenuous, you don't worry about it too much because that's just the way it's supposed to be. So for my dad, recognizing that that text was about a very different thing, and then also, and I said, go into much more depth in the book about the history of interpretation of the Sodom story, how for the first really 2,000 years of that story's existence, of course, it dates back probably to about mm -hmm. 1400 BC, at least in the oral tradition. It was not understood by the Israelites and the ancient Jews to be about same sex anything. Uh, and then the 20 other references to Sodom and Gomorrah and the rest of the Bible do not refer to same sex behavior as part of the sin of Sodom, but are quite explicit that the sin has, of Sodom has to do with arrogance and apathy toward the poor, oppression, inhospitality, all sorts of those things. So for my dad, that really was a door opener mm -hmm. for him in going back to some of these other texts because he figured if I could have been mistaken about this text, then it's possible he's, I've been mistaken about these other texts. And there's another really important text in the New Testament uh, by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, where Paul, is des Paul describes and condemns um, lustful same-sex behavior. And he talks about how, without going into all the detail, he talks about how women exchanged natural for unnatural relations and men abandoned natural relations with women, became inflamed with lust one for another, and committed indecent acts with other men. And I remember just sitting down. With, for a lot of evangelicals, that text is perhaps the most important one in terms of what would be a stumbling block for them for reconsidering. And I just remember telling my dad, I was like, Dad, like just over di over the, the our dinner table one night, like these people are consumed with their lusts. 
it specifically is talking about people who are just like lust filled. And I was just like, that is not like my goal or my vision mm-hmm. for my future, right? Like I want to have a relationship that's like the relationship you have with mom. That's a stable, um, long-term relationship that's the basis of a home and a family. Not just like a, and I was just like, to me, like these are really different issues. And that text, I mean, is a very complicated text. So there's a lot more that could be mm-hmm. said about it. But for my dad, just recognizing that distinction, you're right, like he was saying, this is explicitly talking about people who are consumed with lustfulness. And he just never really considered that it's possible that there are same-sex relationships that don't fit into that paradigm. Mm-hmm. I, I know I mean, that, can, that can sound very ignorant. I mean, in a, in mm-hmm. a sense, because it is ignorant of just, but it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily hateful. Like a lot of people assume that Christians who are against same-sex marriage must be like, terribly bigoted, hateful people. And you can always find some examples of truly hateful right. people. But in the main, that's not true. Mm-hmm. It's like my dad never had any malice toward anyone. It doesn't mean that he was right. It doesn't mean that his position was accurate or helpful. It's inaccurate and does harm to people. But if you start with a posture of like anger toward the harm that people's beliefs do, then you put them on the defensive because then they typically feel like their character is being maligned. And so I find it much more helpful to start with a posture of relationship, of like genuine affection or respect for the person, especially Mm -hmm. if you know them, and respect for their heart and their motives. But then within that context, really earnestly asking them to look more critically at the consequences of their beliefs. And so even though I know you're not coming from a place of wanting to do harm, mm-hmm. like these beliefs, like they still have this harmful impact on my life. And so would you be willing to look at this a bit more closely with me? I found that to be vastly more effective mm-hmm. than an approach that just sort of assumes that everybody who's against gay marriage is hateful. Um, it's much more effective not to try to ascribe a single motive to a very wide group of people, but instead to meet people on their own terms mm-hmm. in the context of relationship and community and then focus on the impact rather than the intention. Okay. So that's sort of a... Thanks. Yeah. Questions? Yes. I was kind of interested to see what your experiences and your discussions with other people. Um, those that you say that uh, have the Bible in high regard, and in terms of like you, the discussions that you've led with them to kind of see things in a different light, because from my experience, um, talking about with these like so-called uh, Bible thumpers, quote unquote. Um, uh, I think a lot of um, passages and scriptures are cherry picked um, for to to formulate uh, their belief system. Um, and so if you then you know provide them with other passages that you know that you know like are, aren't taken as seriously, like polyester or. Um, uh, so forth, um, wearing polyester, um, then it's not like, it's like, oh, that's pish posh, you know? Um, so I'm just kind of curious to see what, um, like what your experience with talking to other people about that. So I think part of my experience, part of what's helped me is to, I feel like I have a pretty strong understanding of why those Christians who disagree with me believe what they believe. And that is, rare in their experience. So I don't know if you've seen, you may have, I'm sure some people here have, there's a famous clip from the West Wing from probably 2007, where the president on the West Wing gets into this debate with this conservative radio host about, you say that homosexuality is an abomination, then he goes and he lists all these other things from the Old Testament about, oh, but do you sell your daughter into slavery, et cetera. And there's like a mic drop at the end, Uh, not literally, but, and, you know, and, and that, that clip has had millions of views, and a lot of people just assume, oh, like, such hypocrisy for Christians to, to wear polyester but to be against same-sex relationships. But that's really, like, not the heart of the theological issue for most Christians. So it is true that, like, the book of Leviticus prohibits male same-sex sex. Um, but, and, but it, and of course, also prohibits a ton of other things that Christians don't follow anymore. But that's not really hypocrisy because... Christians who are being more informed about it are not going to ground their opposition to same-sex relationships primarily in Leviticus 
or in the Old Testament because the New Testament talks extensively about how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament law. And Jesus says not one jot or tittle will fall away from the law, but the way that the New Testament authors interpret that is in the context of the Old Testament law no longer having force, no longer applying to God's people under the new covenant in the same way that it did to the ancient Israelites. So most Christians who are being more thoughtful about it would ground their opposition to same-sex relationships in New Testament texts uh, that are part of the new covenant or in sort of like a broader, what they see as a broader narrative arc within scripture from like the Genesis creation texts um, then through to how the New Testament, they believe, interprets or uses those texts. So in that sense, yeah, I, I, part of what I'm trying to do is to persuade conservative Christians to rethink their interpretation. Another part of what I'm trying to do is to persuade more progressive Christians to make better arguments when they're in conversations with conservative Christians. And so I don't think, if your argument to somebody is, why are you against gay marriage when you're not against polyester? Like, I've seen that argument persuade people about like 0% of the time because it doesn't demonstrate an awareness of why they actually believe what they believe, right? So you're kind of just like working around the edges. What's much more interesting though is that same principle, it's not to say that there is no inconsistency in how things are being applied, but you have to be really careful how you approach that. So well, much more interesting text than the polyester texts or than any of the prohibitions in Leviticus is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses um, 14 and 15, where it specifically says, do you not know that nature itself teaches that for a man to have long hair is a disgrace to him, but for a woman to have long hair is to her glory? The reason why this is so fascinating is because the text of Romans 1, which is the longest New Testament text or longest biblical text referring to same-sex behavior, uses two of the very same Greek words, words for nature and for disgrace. That's phusis and atomia. And in Romans 1, a lot of conservative Christians want to say that those words about what goes against nature refer to what they call a cre the creational order or something that was established at the very beginning in Genesis 1 and 2, and therefore something that is normative for Christians today. But ask them how they interpret 1 Corinthians 11. And most Christians today will tell you that they think nature in that text refers to social custom or convention, and that what makes it disgraceful has to do with what the given cultural norms of the day are. And I happen to agree with them in 1 Corinthians 11. The term nature has a really wide range of potential uses in ancient Greek and in a lot of contemporaneous texts, extra biblical texts, and within the biblical canon itself. What that means, though, is if they're willing to read those very same terms in the New Testament in a way that is culturally conditioned and confined, then that's a much better text to use for saying, well, why don't you read Romans 1 in the same way? Because it's actually operating within the world that they're operating within. So it's much better to make sure you know what they believe their strongest arguments to be or their, their most important texts to be going into it and then focus on texts and arguments that are relevant to those things. So that's part of what's actually made a lot of my conversations really good and effective is because a lot of evangelicals have never been engaged on their own terms in a really meaningful way before on this topic. And so all that they've ever, the only sort of paradigm that they've had is a combat paradigm of like the secular LGBT activists versus the faithful conservative Christians. And so it's very easy then to people, for them just to sort of stay entrenched in their belief system and say, look, our whole belief system is under attack by people who think that the whole idea of God and religion is stupid. But, you know, and so that, that way it's much more of a, we're, we're keeping our community, we're keeping our identity and our values intact and preserved. But the conversation shifts radically when you actually have a member of the community who shares all of those core beliefs, who cares about the community, who has relationships with people in the community, who's simply asking people to reconsider their interpretation of a select amount of texts, not to reconsider the importance of the Bible, the importance of God or their faith. Like that's just a very different conversation. And if you actually are, have the privilege, as I've had, of being able to take the time to really do your homework before you go into those conversations. Like a lot of people are just, it's unprecedented for a lot of people. 
and for not for the majority, at least not initially, but for a minority, those types of arguments can change their minds. And all you need is a minority, especially within the evangelical world. Like, what does that word mean, right? It's about like um, spreading the good news. So evangelicals love to, to let people know what they believe. And so if you can change what they believe about a topic, it's, it's, it's awesome. Because then they're going to let like a 1,000 people know about their new belief about it. So that's, uh, that's mm -hmm. part of the, yeah, it's not easy. It's, it's not fast. But it's definitely possible mm -hmm. and worthwhile. Great question. Thanks. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate what you're trying to do um, in engaging uh, conservative evangelicals. And uh, it's really encouraging to hear uh, a lesson uh, or uh, a more than theologically superficial look at Leviticus. And uh, yeah, that's, that's really great. Um, in terms of furthering that dialogue, uh, James White has offered to debate with you several times. I was curious what the reasons are that that uh, hasn't happened. Yeah, so when I posted my initial talk three years ago, there was a Southern Baptist minister in Phoenix who recorded a four-hour rebuttal, podcast rebuttal, to my talk. And, well, so here's what I would say. I, when I'm thinking about Christians who disagree with me on this topic, they lie along a spectrum. Or rather, Christians who don't vocally agree with me on this topic. They lie along a spectrum. You have a minority of people who are, are silent sympathizers, who may not fully agree with me, who may, may not, but those are the people who really, if you reach them with these arguments, it's like you've liberated them. And, and they finally like, feel free to express their beliefs, and they can become really passionate advocates. Then there are a lot of people in the middle, I'd say the majority of people in the middle, who passively hold negative beliefs, what I would call non-affirming beliefs about same-sex relationships. Um, and who truly believe those things, but don't think about it a ton, would never write a letter to the editor about it, would never call up a radio show about it. That's where my dad was. Then you have a substantial minority of people who I would say are deeply entrenched and passionate about their opposition. Uh, and those people tend to be the most established people in any given church community, especially the more conservative churches. They tend to make institutional change very difficult because they will threaten to pull their financial giving from a church if it shifts at all on the topic. And so what I'm trying to do, and it, they also give the impression to a lot of people that everyone in the community not only shares their belief, but also shares that passion with which they hold their belief, because no one else is actually saying anything. So they kind of have the megaphone. When I'm engaging people on this topic, I am most interested in engaging the people who are the silent sympathizers and the people in the middle. Because most people who are in that place of entrenched passion opposition cannot be reached um, right now. I don't ever, I try never to write people off entirely, but I do postpone people. And I will postpone engagement with some people because the way that they think and talk about these topics is so unhelpful and so devoid of any kind of relational um, care or understanding that I don't that they're just not really worth my energy. So James White and his talk, I mean, he compared being gay to wanting to have sex with dogs and things that are so absurd and so offensive. And he was so passionate about it and saw no reason, you know, talked about comparisons to pedophilia and said that only, you know, 1% of gay people actually want monogamy. I don't know where he got that statistic. And, like, and, and there, I mean, it was, it was a highly vitriolic four hours. And honestly, that's not worth my time. Because there are so many people who are worth my time and who are thoughtful and kind. And there are some people who are truly vitriolic and who are not kind, are not compassionate. And I am not, like, my time is worth so much more than, like, wasting it, going down into a gutter with people who want to compare me to, like, people who want to have sex with dogs. So that's the reason why I haven't engaged James White, because he's not worth engaging. But there are many people who are worth engaging. So Tim Keller is a pastor from New York, um, pretty well-known pastor, evangelical pastor, who I've learned a lot from. I think he's a great writer and preacher. He just reviewed my book a couple weeks ago. Um, and I didn't really, I mean, 
you know, it was a negative review, which wasn't surprising because I know what he thinks about this topic. But I really appreciated that he did because that he reviewed my book with a tone of civility. He didn't say horrendous things about gay people. Um, and he was focusing on my actual arguments and in a way that was a bit more, a lot more level headed. So that allowed me, you know, I wrote a response to it about things that I agreed with and a lot of things I didn't agree with and thought that he actually misrepresented in my book. But through that process, that is what opens the door to genuine, to genuine like conversation. It doesn't mean that he's going to agree with me anytime soon, but I want to focus on people who are engaging thoughtfully. Um, and so, and there are enough of them, like I can spend all my time doing that. <laughs> Um, my question is uh, specifically referring to your arguments uh, using uh, Matthew 7 verses 15 through 20 on false prophets and good fruit versus bad fruit. Uh, I in particular find that argument uh, very compelling. Uh, do you think that same argument could also be used to perhaps get the church to re-examine its traditional stances on things like women's roles in the church and other social equality issues which, for which there may be other silent sympathizers such as gender role, seeing as how traditionally these teachings may have had a bit more of a negative impact on those members of the congregation who would like to voice those um, opinions. And um, do you think that can be done in a way that presents a theological framework that is also, as you said, persuasive to evangelicals? That's a good question. I think that that type of experience um, argument is cer certainly played a key role in Christians reevaluating their beliefs about slavery. Because a lot of people will, a lot of Christians today will try to say, oh, slavery in the, in the old, you know, in the first century Rome was so different than slavery in 19th century America. And there were some differences. Slavery in 19th century America was race-based, uh, and it was not in the same way in the first century. But slavery in the first century Rome was brutal. I mean, this was not like a benign form of actually voluntary servitude for seven years and then you get to go on and live your life. That's not what it was. And there's ample historical evidence showing how horrific slavery in the biblical era actually was. So while there are some differences, they're not really, a, I mean, they don't really get to the core of what we find abhorrent about slavery today. So it's not like what slavery was changed in a radical way, but more Christians became more empathetic to the cries of the oppressed. And from a Christian standpoint, that looking at the narrative arc of scripture, so much of which does focus on the liberation of captives, the freedom, freedom for the oppressed, those, the, the kind of radical dignity that should be bestowed upon every person um, within a Judeo-Christian worldview, like not just upon like kings, right, but that all people are created equally in the image of God, like that should have these implications uh, for how we think about and how much we care about listening to marginalized and oppressed voices. Unfortunately, that's not often been reflected in the history of the church, but when the abolitionist movement began to gain traction in the church, especially in the 19th century, listening, I mean, that type of experience, people pleading for other people to simply look others in the eyes and really consider their struggles was a big part of that in terms of women's roles. But at the same time, it's never a sufficient part of it. Like, I think that there should always, I, I kind of am torn because on the one hand, um, I think that there should generally be a bias in favor of tradition in the sense that from a Christian standpoint, even though we know that the tradition got a, a number of important things wrong, slavery, heliocentrism, the subjugation of women, um, anti-Semitism, <clears throat> the vast majority of things that Christians recite like every Sunday in the creeds, like those are all part of the Christian tradition. Like the core things that we believe about Christian orthodoxy, about the Trinity, about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, these are all traditional beliefs. And the idea of, if you always have a bias against tradition, it's exhausting <laughs> at one level um, to be constantly like throwing up in the air all these things. But also, there can be a presumptuousness to it. There can be an arrogance to it. Not always, but there can be to just assuming that there is not great wisdom in 
not just a generation before you, but in generation after generation after generation, and all of the wisdom that can be accumulated through that. However, at the same time, I also feel like there should be a bias in favor of the oppressed. And those two things do clash, right? Because a bias in favor of tradition that has no qualifications is also a bias in favor of, well, straight, cisgender, landowning, white men. <laughs> right? Like, mm -hmm. And so how do you make that balance? Like, there's a te There can be a tendency then, looking at like so much of the harm and oppression that's caused then, to just swing against tradition entirely. And while I'm sympathetic to why people do that, I think that can lead to, um, well, Another set of problems. Yeah, it just leads to an entirely different set of, um, of issues that I'm not really sure are the key to liberation for oppressed peoples. So it's kind of like holding those things in tension. So I would say, like, I think the experience paradigm matters a lot, but because I think that tradition matters a lot, because I think that scripture has to be, because I think that the, the authority of scripture matters a lot, you kind of have to hold those things in tension. So like with something like women's roles, you can definitely make the case from experience. I mean, this is, this is what we see in the book of Acts, where they say, look, like, we know that you don't think Gentiles can be, um, can be part of God's people, but we see the fruit, we, we see them, we see the fruit of the Spirit, right? And we see that they have the Spirit at work in them. Therefore, they can be part of the Christian community. So that was a pretty experience-based mm -hmm. argument. And so people certainly, you can make that type of argument about saying, look, we see women who are serving in leadership positions. We see all these gifts that, that they are um, offering to the church. We see their ministries being blessed or something. At the same time, you want to buttress that. You want to supplement that with making a scriptural case as well for, you know, here is where we see, you know, kind of movement in scripture toward uh, women occupying more leadership positions or toward greater equality in roles for men and women, those sorts of things. So I think it's like a both and. Uh, this is a little bit more of sort of a personal question, um, so you can decide how personal you want to be. But for me, one of the challenges of being gay and Christian, um, like I spent a lot of time kind of reconciling how I could be both, and I wish I'd had your book 10 years ago. But now I, one of the things that I actually shared with my pastor a few weeks ago is struggling with how to be gay and Christian in 2015 in San Francisco. And so there's so many kind of cultural norms around sexuality, for example, and like, you know, it's like, sort of a gay stereotype, but you have sex and then you go on the first date. Um, and so it's how do, you, how do you think about kind of other teachings around sexuality, around how we express that, um, and how do you kind of live a, a godly Christian life in the context of a culture um, that is highly sexualized? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question. I would say my first answer to it is the way that I approach that is that it's really sensitive. And so I am always, especially issues around sex and sexual ethics, when you are talking about a community of people that has been rejected by the church, you, there there's just has to be so much sensitivity around that um, and a lot of grace around that. I think that um, really conservative Christians in particular if they want to say all same-sex relationships are wrong and they want to offer no support for LGBT people uh, living out a uh, hope for you know, their relational future or romantic future or family, then what place do they really have to criticize people um, who they think aren't living in a sufficiently chaste way or something? Because it's like, look, like you're offering people nothing and then you know, just going to condemn them when they're just trying to find their own way in the world. So I, I'm very sympathetic to that. At the same time, I think that that's a totally non-ideal situation, right? Like ideally, you shouldn't have millions of gay kids being rejected by their Christian families all over the world in the name of Jesus and then made to loathe themselves and loathe their sexuality and then seek to swing the pendulum in the other direction by like totally embracing every potential aspect of your sexuality you could conceive of for like five years and then getting tired of it and then like swinging back to the middle, right? Like that's not really ideal. So what I'm trying to do is twofold. One is the pastoral lens, which is about how much grace and sensitivity you have to have and you just can't like preach at people. You have to listen, you have to build relationship, you have to be willing to like learn and grow from people. But that's the pastoral lens. But then there's also this kind of theological or doctrinal lens, which is the question of ideally, what should the church be teaching? 
And even though there has to be a whole lot of space and grace in the midst of like recovering from really the church's sins against the LGBT community, what I what what would be the theological ideal? Um, and so the ideal that I present, I mean, so basically, I grew up being taught that sex is for marriage, and I never really had an issue with that. And I was sort of like, from when I, you know, from as as first, when I learned about sex, however old I was, I don't even remember. I was just like, all right, like that's something I'll do when I get married. It's gonna be great, you know. And never really thought about it. And so then, I mean, not they didn't think about it. I'm saying never thought about like uh, that was never like a source of stress for me or anything. Like that was something I wanted to do, and that was that was just a part of who I wanted to be and how I wanted to live. And so when I realized that I was gay. I was just like, well, I don't really, I don't want to radically change who I am. Like, I don't think being gay should require you to overturn like um, value systems that are important to you. And so I was like, well, honestly, like, I just want to live in the same way that I would if I hadn't been gay. Is there the same support for it? <laughs> Not really. So, but that's why I'm almost seeking to live into. Oftentimes in uh, Christian theology, there's this conversation around the already and the not yet. Right around eschatology, and that's like the you know end times theology, but also just the question of we're living into this new creation that's been inaugurated by Jesus, that in which all things will be redeemed and all things will be made new, but we're not there yet, and so there's that tension. But I think we need some people who are seeking to live into the not yet, um, or seeking to live into seeking to sort of to bring. To, to bring more of the not yet into the already in the sense of if I want churches to be creating the support system for people like me to be able to pursue a relationship and a family in the same way that we thought we could back when we didn't realize we were gay, then we're going to need some people who are just like living into, into like living in the anticipation of that. Uh, and so that's why that is still how I want to live. Uh, and I think that there are good theological reasons for that being an ideal um, that, I, that I sort of discuss in the book. And I, I hope that by, and I know that there are you know, a number of gay Christians who feel the same way, but there are plenty of people who don't feel the same way and other gay Christians who, or maybe who did feel the same way, feel it's practically impossible or something. And so I, that's why people, like, I just feel like there's been enough of a kind of shame-based culture around these topics that I'm much more interested in saying, look, like I, especially for, for people who are like LGBT Christians, I think like people should do their best, like strive to do your best, um, and like do the best that you can, and that's gonna look different for different people, but in a con, like our goal is to be, you know, modeling and showing like this is what like really positive, meaningful same sex relationships can look like. And so, you know, I want people to do their best. To seek to live that out, but the, you know, people sometimes people's relationships will fail, or they're going to have really bad relationships, and there's no need for people to feel like overwhelming shame about that. Um, I just, you know, I think it is helpful when we have some gay Christians who are who have enough support or are just able to live live more into anticipation of that to be able to model for people like this is what an option could be, and then to be able to present that model in a much more like non in your face, non like you must do this or we're gonna like bang a hammer over your head way, but just sort of like, I would have just loved to have seen actual role models doing that when I came out to say like, I knew that's what I wanted, but I couldn't find anybody who was doing that, right? And so, you know, it's still kind of a, a tiny niche, <laughs> but that's at least how I'm seeking to approach it. But I also think that there just has to be like a lot of grace in light of how much harm the church has directly done on these very topics. Have you had much experience talking with Christians who are not evangelicals, who are, or perhaps from traditions that are far away from your own? Maybe Christians from maybe the Orthodox tradition or far afield from your own. And is there any difference in the sorts of conversations you have with them? There is a lot of difference. And so most of the conversations that I have will kind of be in my wheelhouse, theologically. I try not to overstep my my bounds too much. So I'm much more interested in meeting, for instance, when it comes to Catholics, I'm much more interested in meeting like other LGBT Catholics who are interested in and who care about reforming their church and helping them, helping equip them with 
uh, the scripture, I mean, the scriptures are not identical, of course, for Catholic and Protestants, but on this issue, the scriptural yeah, the issues are pretty much the same. Of course, Catholics have additional layers of theological discourse around all issues. And so, that does, but so there, there are important areas of overlap. So I'm interested in like building those relationships and helping to equip people in those contexts with a lot of the scriptural resources that they need, but then they're really gonna be, have to be the ones who take that and run with it in terms of tailoring it to their specific environment and denomination or theological context, adding to it, refining it, adapting it. So I am rarely gonna be the person having, like in terms of a lot of the conversations that I have, it's mostly gonna be with Protestant evangelical pastors and leaders. And in, once you get to other contexts, like I just, you know, I, I don't wanna be, I don't want to be trying to represent people when I know that there are other people who know a lot more about their particular context than I do. So that's why I want to be just like building those relationships, seeking to equip and empower to the extent that I can, to the extent that it makes sense, but then letting like LGBT Catholics or LGBT Orthodox Christians like really take the initiative on that. And so then the last thing I would say is that is a lot of what we do with the Reformation Project is bring in people from a wide variety of backgrounds equip them with these scriptural resources and arguments, but then allow them and seek to help them and empower them as they are the best people in their particular context. So we're doing a conference, our next big conference is in Kansas City, November 5th through the 7th, and we're doing one in LA actually next year. So if you're interested, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or you can sign up for the conferences at reformationproject.org, or if you can't go, but you know family or friends who you think would benefit from it, you should send them because it's a really, it's sort of a great melting pot of uh, traditions. And even though the dominant group there would still probably be evangelical Protestants, of course we have Catholics and Orthodox Christians there as well who can really enrich our understandings too. Thanks for that question. Um, thank you for being with us today. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, integrity that you bring to the conversation because you're open to other ideas instead of being here to kind of force anything on anybody. I appreciate that, and especially from a perspective that's a little different in terms of our trying to understand. But every, I think every congregation, everybody is really coming together in real interesting ways. At least we're having a discussion. And I appreciate that you want a discussion and not an argument or a, a fisticuffs, you know. So right. I, thanks for very much for bringing that to the, to the conversation. And with you, I, I'm appreciative, aren't you, as well? So thank you. Well, thank you so much. Yeah.